Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Olive Kokeman, and for the Network for Improving Quality of Care for Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health. Welcome to our very first webinar of 2021. This is a series of special topics that are being organized by the Network for Improving Quality of Care and the World Health Organization. The series is dedicated to learning maternal and newborn health and quality improvement in countries that are beyond one of the 12 um, network member countries, but are indeed advancing and learning and quality improvement for maternal and newborn health and have just so much to share with us. It's my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Nella Lincetto and Dr. Hart Savell two inspiring, incredible, hardworking and visionary leaders that um, I've been so um, lucky to work with um, for newborn health. Uh, the work in the Western Pacific region um, under the leadership of Howard uh, has rich experience and lessons to share with us all. And this is also an important year for small and sick newborn care. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Arnella. Um, the last thing I want to say is our um, series, this presentation, um, will have two parts. First, we will have um, Arnella to introduce um, Dr. Harris Sabell. then Howard will give his presentation. In the second part, this is when we want to hear from you. We have questions and answers for 20 minutes. So please share your questions with us in the chat box and we'll curate them and ask them um, to Howard and, and to Arnella at the end of the session. So over to you, Arnella. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Olive. Good morning. Good afternoon, good evening to all of you. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce to you uh, Dr. Howard Sobel, uh, who is the coordinator, the regional coordinator on the maternal uh, uh, child health and quality safety in the uh, uh, office, regional office of Western Pacific. He's a pediatrician and has been working with WHO for since I know him, meaning more than 20 years at least. And uh, today he will share with us the experience of implementing and scaling up the Early Essential Newborn Care Program, which is also known with a very nice name, the First Embrace. As the name indicates, the focus of the program is in creating the conditions for the best start in life for every newborn. And this implies working with health providers to review the current practices and to ensure that only evidence-based practices are in place and the harmful ones are removed. But also the program implies, implement, uh, requires uh, full engagement of the participants and uh, working with the entire team, looking at organizational care and, many, and, and much more. I had the pleasure to work, of working with uh, Dr. Sobel at the initial development of, uh, of this program. And uh, also we test some of the materials in PNG in the initial phase. And then uh, of course I'm among the promoters of the approach. And uh, I really think that uh, it's fantastic. So please, uh, I hand over to, to uh, uh, Howard for the presentation and enjoy the, the talk. Okay, th thank you very much, Ornell. I think that, uh, um, can I confirm that everyone can hear me? Yes. And my slides have gone up. Uh, so the second success of the evening, thank you very much to everyone. So it is my pleasure to present before all of you. I'm going to um, uh, start with, um, talking about what prompted us in uh, early essential newborn care. When I was working in the Philippines and I started doing, uh, and I was uh, working there actually as an immunization officer, but in country level, you never do one thing. And so I inherited several different programs and a neonatal sepsis outbreak occurred in 2008. And that was my real entry point into newborn care. And when we started looking into it, we were finding in Philippines and subsequently just about everywhere I went, we saw the things on the right of the screen. Uh, and these are unnecessary suctioning. The baby is vigorous and crying. You can see that. Uh, and, there's, and they're suctioning. The baby's wet, hasn't been dried. Uh, the cord has, not, it has already been clamped. You can see that in the background. They're using a filthy bulb to suction at that. 
and you can see the babies separated from the mother and you can just see that that baby is distressed and cyanotic. Uh, and on the other side, what we, what we found is that um, what we were aiming for after our review in 2008, 2009, was we started to identify some things that were really critical. Now this, um, and to the, to the left side, these are the things that benefit babies, immediate drying, delayed cord clamping, and skin-to-skin -skin contact, among many other things that I'll go into. So, um, okay, how do I do next slide here? I guess I'll do it down there. Uh, the, in 2012, I was brought from Cambodia. I'd been in Philippines and Cambodia, and I was brought to the regional office, and the regional director basically backed us on developing the action plan for healthy newborns to address these issues. And the goal was to eliminate preventable newborn mortality by providing universal access to high quality early essential newborn care, a term that was agreed in one of the consultations, uh, member state consultations. And the targets were that at least 80% of facilities where births take place implement EENC, 90% of births in subnational areas are attended by SBAs, and the NMR of less than 10 per thousand in national, subnational. There was a, an asterisk to that, that places that already met the target or have no hope to meet the target will uh, accelerate rate of reduction by two to three times of what it currently is. And this is a real quick snapshot of what EENC is. You've got six blocks here, three for the mother, three for the baby. Uh, you've got two for both, uh, for, uh, two for all babies and mothers. And then, uh, then you've got uh, two for preterm and low birth weight and two for sick newborns. I just wanna hi highlight um, that while skin to skin contact was something that we identified subsequent to that, we've gone much deeper and the, the box at the bottom uh, talks about at least 90 minutes of uninterrupted skin to skin contact and early uh, breastfeeding that starts between 15 and 90 minutes. I'll give a little bit of, a, of the evidence behind that. There's a, practically, it makes total sense since, um, the, since it's been known a long time that the median baby doesn't uh, start breastfeeding until 55 minutes. So that means nearly half don't start breastfeeding, don't initiate breastfeeding until after that. Uh, and we also aim to eliminate harmful practices that increased risk of infection, hypothermia, and death, unnecessary separations, which exposes them to unclean surfaces, carer hands, NICUs, and formula, and unnecessary suction, as I mentioned before, which has risks of trauma, infection, bradycardia, and apnea, and unnecessary procedures such as episiotomy and C-section. So who are our countries? We have eight priority countries. Those are Cambodia, China, Laos, Mongolia, Papua New Guinea, Philippines, Solomon Islands, and Vietnam. And then in 2018, Vanuatu joined the party. Uh, so we have nine now. And beyond the Western Pacific region, we have, uh, we have introduced, I've personally introduced in, in two of the three, uh, into Sierra, Emro, and uh, sorry, all three uh, regions, uh, Sierra, Emro, and Afro regions. So we have a total of 26 countries, 13 in our region and 13 outside of our region. I'm gonna go walk you a little bit through um, the approach that we took. Um, I just wanna start by saying that we started a little bit traditional. We started by saying, okay, we need policy support cost of the EENC national plans, national technical working groups, et cetera, et cetera. And these, while these are important, they're, they're really boring um, when you do these things in isolation. Uh, we discovered that, we, that if it's done naturally, then it's much better. If it's something, it's, it's a natural thing that comes out of the process, it's much better. So the best selling point for EENC is a healthy newborn. A, uh, and the quote from Cambodia back in, let me, let, let me first say that this is something that, that everybody loves. Mothers, babies, families, health workers, everybody loves it. 
And so it's a win for, it's a complete win to target this. And one of the midwives in Cambodia where we started the coaching technique uh, in 2011 said, after practicing the new approach, the babies are stronger. They breathe better than the other approach. They turn pink faster. And pretty much we've heard this uh, in different ways in every country. So I'm not gonna go into detail on this slide because I'm gonna walk you through them individually, but this gives you a, a broad picture of the different uh, modules that we have for EENC. So I just wanna mention though that each module got tested and revised some between 20 and 60 times uh, across the eight countries to maximize applicability and usability and eliminate any ambiguity. So the module two, which is the first one that got published um, ironically uh, was about coaching and it's, uh, it was something that, uh, that health workers loved. Um, uh, it's a, and I'll go through some details about it. It's a two day coaching. It takes place in a delivery room. So you have a realistic environment. Uh, one of the points that I have on this is that in every single place that I have done the coaching, the delivery room has changed in front of our eyes during the time that the coaching was going on. People would rearrange the, the room so that it was more amenable to practice. The environment is absolutely critical for getting things done well. There's no lectures, no PowerPoints. Um, we had help worker, uh, let me start by saying facilitators had to make the, if they had a point they wanted to make, they had to frame it as a question that we wanted to eliminate lectures, uh, make this all about the participants and not about the, uh, the facilitators. The health workers had to demonstrate uh, current practices unassisted so that we understood where, what were the issues that we needed to address there. We can't expect people to come to our level. We need to start by understanding where they are at and then bring them along in a systematic way. Facilitators coach participants until the newborn care steps are mastered. They have to get 90% of the steps to, to pass on two demonstration scenarios and pre and post coaching tests uh, to ensure participants uh, meet the minimum standards. And a quote from in 2014 from the hospital director and national OBGYN hospital, uh, staff usually don't wanna go back to the next day, but they were excited to continue. We've had similar quotes in most countries. Uh, uh, and I have one of my favorites is that I, I was told while this is, wow, these senior guys usually leave, but do you know what he just did? He took out his phone, somebody, because someone was calling, he said, is it urgent? The person said no, and he put it back in his pocket. So he says, normally these people wouldn't stick around for, for more than an hour. They decide it wasn't worth it for them, but they were sticking around for the full two days. Uh, here's some results uh, that um, it, it's a bit a, a while ago, um, 2016, when we looked at baseline and then we, um, and then we looked at, uh, this is pre and post uh, coaching. Uh, and I wanna highlight for a moment, uh, the breathing baby scenario. So these are baby, I mean, these are health workers that were trained an average of three or four times in different newborn resuscitation courses. And this is how they performed in our coaching and I can go into a lot of detail why that is, but the bottom line is that the methodologies did not stick for long, long enough for them to be able to demonstrate uh, the correct uh, steps. And also we, when we asked them why they didn't do it, they said, oh, the others are theory, or we didn't practice like we're doing here. We didn't have to prove that we could do the things. We didn't learn it in sequential order. Those type of things were the answers we got. And this is the post-test. Everybody had to get 90% to pass in that. Um, and the, um, it, I just wanna highlight in Solomon Islands, they looked a year later. This is a publication. Um, I should have written down the publication there. I'll, I have to update this one. Uh, this, uh, I think it's BMC, um, Childbirth and Pregnancy. Um, but I'll, I'll get, I'll give that to the organizers later, which, which one this is. 
Um, and what we found was that a baseline typical, they didn't do very well at um, post-test, uh, they did excellent. And there was some drop off, but I wanna break it up a little bit. Um, the drop off was the most by the people that did not that were not routinely doing newborn um, uh, care of uh, uh, um, routine care in the delivery room of uh, babies. But the midwives and the nurse assistants, they had only a 4% drop off a year later. So it stuck with them very well. Uh, it was identified here and it's been identified elsewhere that newborn resuscitation needs a little bit more practice and probably we should be doing uh, more of that quarterly or whatever in facilities as part of their KPIs. This is how many people have been coached as of 2018. Uh, it's probably a lot higher. We, um, we are having trouble getting data from one of the very large countries. And so it's grossly underrepresented, we believe. I think it's probably closer to uh, 50,000, but this is, a, this is the curve that uh, we've seen over the years from 20, really from 2012 is when I started, but 2010 and 11, I was working first in Philippines and then in Cambodia. So those are those numbers. I just wanna describe what it takes to be a national facilitator. Each person must pass the two day coaching, uh, demonstration, hand hygiene and written tests. So they go through the full two days uh, as, as participants. And then they have to demonstrate on one day how to coach. It's a uh, it's a um, it, it's in our module. We developed this to try to transfer the skills. It's not an easy thing to coach because people are used to giving lectures. And here, what you have to do is listen to the uh, temperature of the room, follow their line of thinking, and keep asking questions. But make sure you cover the basics of uh, EENC. And then they do two days of. Uh, supervised coaching and we continue uh, we continue to coach them uh, before during it before after uh, and if during breaks and if necessary during uh, so that they can continue to build their skills and so the when we go into countries it takes us about a week and in the process usually on day three we also uh, work out a plan for um, and for um, supporting scaling up within the hospital and where they're gonna go. So this is what I mean by it's natural. Uh, and but, but we don't start off big. We wanna get, those, get them to have their skills, strong skills in these hospitals and then start to move on beyond. And then the process is repeated at subnational level. So how are we doing? Well, there's 6,017 health facilities uh, the, um, with greater than uh, 50 deliveries a year that have introduced EENC. That's about a 79% increase from 2017. Obviously the program started uh, for real uh, in about uh, outside of Philippines and Cambodia in about uh, 2014. Uh, and you can see that uh, four countries have met the target uh, two of them I already mentioned, Cambodia, Philippines, but Solomon Islands and Vietnam, uh, additional. And, uh, and beyond that, we have uh, Lao, Mongolia, and, um, uh, and Papua New Guinea that are approaching the target. And Vanuatu, even after just two years, is doing quite excellent. So we're doing quite well uh, in, in terms of uh, China is a large country, and it's going to take a while to to get uh, to get uh, to bring that fully into China. But it, it's a start. About six to thirteen weeks after we introduce the coaching, we come back and introduce module three, which is to help establish facility quality improvement processes for EENC. And what usually happens here. I'll go through the details in a moment, but I'm going to tell you the outcomes. What almost always happens in my experience is people walk in with a bit of a swagger because they did the coaching and they've done very well, if they have, most of them do. And then they do this and they discover, wow, we've got a long way to go. But because they've been through the coaching and we've got trust built and they've been through this process, then it 
uh, they take it on seriously. And when we come back another time, at, at maybe three months later, they usually fix the things they could fix at that level. So what? So this is uh, uh, so this is a the pictures of the actual things that go on. I should start by saying. You'll notice that she's a nurse. Uh, this is in China in, in a relatively, um, in, in one, of the, um, pro, um, one of the municipalities, uh, actually city uh, outside in Sichuan. And uh, our end users are the ones that collect the information, uh, analyze it, prioritize and develop plans. So this is an example of one of the nurses doing the interview um, with the uh, with the patient. And we do observation of various things that includes uh, the delivery room practices, the drug supplies, equipment and infection control. Uh, and you'll see to the right there in all of these that um, we go old school. We find that doing PowerPoint presentations uh, takes the interest and fun out of it. So we have everybody write these onto uh, flip chart paper and we post them up on the wall and you'll see in a moment uh, some of it. So you can see here in the lower figure that, uh, that they've taken, they've entered all the data uh, and they're going around the room in a gallery walk discussing different things. And here the person is marking up um, what are the strengths, uh, areas needing the most improvement um, and then later they start to transfer that into another one, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, in the upper one, you see them going through uh, char uh, chart registries. And uh, here again is Xi Chang. Uh, you can see uh, that the stuff is posted on the wall and they're going through discussing on this uh, too small of a space for everyone to stand around it. But what's interesting is this is the hospital director and I find in general, when the hospital director is present uh, for during, out of curiosity for these things and she hung out that we see massive improvements thereafter and it was no exception here. And here we had, this is in Cebu. And uh, I had actually been not, um, well, uh, this is the pedi pediatric director. He's a very good, uh, very good guy there. You can see this is the second event that they did. In 2016, they had gone through and there were lots of problems uh, with it. And when they went back, it was far better than the previous time in most things, not all of them. And over to the right is the, uh, is again, they do this on vinyl uh, printed paper and they write them in. And these are the plans that then get presented to senior hospital management. This is in, um, uh, a much bigger hospital in Sichuan um, in their, um, um, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, but it's the biggest, it, it's the regional hospital uh, and, it, it, and it's the provincial hospital in Sichuan. And here you have the hospital vice director who's present and you can see all around the room, uh, the charts, which the, the, the um, planning was then based on. And we, um, I'm having, um, to the organizers, is there a way I can move this black um, strip that's above because I can't really see my own headers. If not, I'm not gonna worry about it, but I can just uh, give it, I, because I more or less know my slides. Uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, so we had uh, 174 hospitals sampled in eight priority countries in 2017. And at that time, 71% uh, had an uh, a EENC team supported by senior management. I'm oh, sorry, that's uh, 2019. Uh, tw and there was a 55% increase in, from 2017. And 30% have a quality improvement approach. That's a 19% uh, in 2017. We'd like to see it better. Uh, module three then is the annual implementation review. So this is where the planning really begins at national level. All the other things are starting local and, um, and maybe surrounding hospitals. It gets scaled up to surrounding hospitals, but this is where we start the major scale up. So after they've had time to do modules two and modules three, we then do module one, 
if we had uh, done this, if we had ordered everything later, we would have changed the module numbers, but hey, this is how it worked out. We learned by experience. And uh, so this one, basically it goes through a six day process where we have national teams uh, that uh, facilitate uh, uh, local um, assessments um, and they break out into randomly selected parts of the country that are already implementing the ENC. On the left, you see Lao PDR. On the right, you see Papua New Guinea, very same thing, uh, except in this case, um, each of the rows is not a mother, but is a hospital. And where we have it in bigger countries, we then have um, it broken down by regions. Um, these are some of the results that came out of the uh, 2015, 17, and 19, um, excuse me, uh, annual implementation reviews. These are our benchmarks. And you can see that uh, we're doing pretty well in some of them, uh, uh, like the situation analysis, although they're due for their five-year update. Uh, and full-time focal point has improved. I should start by saying that all this stuff was at zero when we started uh, be prior to introducing these in countries. So these are quite major improvements that have happened. Our place that we're doing the weakest is by far our pre-service training. It's probably the hardest thing to work on, but uh, we are, um, uh, but that's a priority for the next two years identified in our last biennial meeting. So we see here, uh, also some of the results. So skin to skin contact, I can tell you from having observed deliveries first in, my, um, in the countries I worked in, Philippines and in Cambodia, and then subsequently uh, in all the other countries at baseline, it simply was not being done. Uh, if it was done, it was done extremely late uh, and there were a lot of bad practices that happened in between. And we published uh, a 2008 study that we did in the Philippines, uh, um, which documented it in the Philippines. Uh, and then I subsequently saw it everywhere else. So that going from near zero to 91% getting any skin to skin contact is a pretty major improvement. Now, when we start to break it down, we see some dropout that skin to skin contact uh, at, um, at skin to skin contact in um, at less than one minute is um, uh, it, it drops a little bit. And then when we look at completion of the quality breastfeed, which we define as 15 minutes while in skin to skin contact, uh, that's not doing, we haven't improved much, but we, from the baseline, uh, but we're, it's a strict definition we're looking at and skin to skin contact of 90 minutes is also quite low. Uh, our breastfeeding, I can tell you in um, several hospitals that we've looked at, at the beginning, when we haven't systematically looked at baseline breastfeeding in hospitals, but in our observation in, in the hospitals we looked at, it was uh, around 30% uh, were initiated while at any time up until when we were doing interviews. And so this is an, an ex a major improvement that we're getting in our hospitals. Uh, 95, 96% in 2017 and 2019. Again, when you look at the time of initiation uh, between 15 and 90 minutes, we haven't fully improved that, uh, but it's much better in the Philippine study that you can look at the median time of initiation uh, of trying to get babies to initiate breastfeeding was uh, eight minutes and they were left in skin to skin, con uh, sorry, they were left to breastfeed for two minutes, a median of two minutes. And it wasn't a real breastfeed. They were, they had their, um, they had their uh, cheeks stroked, uh, trying to get them to root and then they would force them on the breast and what have you. And I was told that's unique to Philippines. And then I went to every other country and it was in every other country that I saw. And so, this is a major improvement. Uh, it, we still have a ways to go and I'm not happy to see a bit of a drop off, but it's not huge. Um, again, the quality breastfeed of greater than 15 minutes. We arbitrarily chose that to get rid of this whole thing of uh, 
uh, two minutes and they call it a breastfeed, uh, making it a point that babies need to be kept there and allowed to have a full breastfeed. And exclusive breastfeeding at discharge was 85%, uh, which is far better than it was when we started. I, I'd like to go uh, to talk a little bit um, here on, um, uh, on initiation. So we, we took the 2017 data and uh, this is published in BMJ Global Health. And we looked at the, the timing, uh, the amount of skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact that the babies had and the proportion that initiated uh, breastfeeding um, compared to ones that were not put in skin-to-skin -skin contact at all. And you can see a dose response curve that's a log scale. So the bottom one was three, nearly 307, the odds ratio was nearly 370 compared to uh, not, uh, not getting any skin-to-skin -skin contact. And if they were put there at all at any time less than 10 minutes, it was about six times more. So you can see a, a beautiful dose response curve. To our knowledge, we're the first that has demonstrated that, and we're the first to demonstrate this in a low and middle in low and middle income countries. We also looked at uh, at exclusive breastfeeding, and when we look at it, um, oops, um, okay, I don't have it there. Uh, when we look at it in bivariate analysis, we have a bunch of things that are statistically associated. But once we um, uh, apparently, I didn't add the other slide. Apologies, you'll have to bear with me. But in multivariate analysis, you, you can see that uh, that non-supine position and skin-to-skin -skin contact were the only things that were associated with exclusive breastfeeding at discharge. So the, these are very nice findings. I'd also like to highlight another point. Uh, in this, that babies that were born by cesarean section, if they were not, uh, if they were not, um, if, if we did adjust for skin-to-skin -skin contact, it was, you can see here that it was 2.6 times, it, it, vaginal deliveries were 2.6 times more likely to be discharged exclusive breastfeeding uh, than those born by cesarean section. But then if you look over here, that whole thing that, uh, that uh, skin to skin contact is a mitigating factor uh, to cesarean section for exclusive breastfeeding. I, I wanna highlight here that, uh, that we're not uniformly getting improvement, but I also wanna point out that these are still far better than at baseline, but our, our cesarean section babies and babies born preterm and low birth weight uh, are not getting uh, nearly as good um, improvements, uh, or not, they're not doing nearly as well as vaginal in many of our indicators. And, but these are still, I still must emphasize, this is far better than it was in 2015 and before where we had anecdotal observation and had kind of shocks to our, to our existence in 2016 when we saw that the preterm babies were just simply not getting these at all. And that's when we started some heavy promotion in, 20, uh, in 2016. Um, this is another publication. I don't know why it's not listed here, but in Journal of Global Health that uh, looked at uh, wash in delivery rooms, postnatal care rooms, recovery rooms, and neonatal care rooms. And you can see that we have sinks. We have mostly with running water and we get a bit of a drop off when we look at sinks with soap. But one of the things that we, I never picked up on before until we started looking at this systematically was the biggest lack in our region is single use towels or some kind of hygienic way to dry their hands. And I don't know why I didn't pick this up because I had witnessed and I have to confess shouted at health workers who dried their hands on their absolutely disgusting uh, lab coats. Um, so, so this is something I didn't pick up and maybe you all in your different regions may wanna look at this as something once you start to get improved uh, sinks and running water 
and getting uh, your soap into place, you may want to look at that. Uh, EEN, th this is a publication in um, Lancet uh, uh, eClinical Medicine, uh, where we looked at pre, post, and Nang Hospital, and we all babies born pre and for the year prior and the year post uh, introduction of EENC. And what you can see here is that NICU admissions dropped by one third, hypoxia, uh, hy hypothermia on admission dropped by 20%, sepsis by two thirds. Uh, it, it, one of the points I'm also uh, at the, I, the IPC person in our region, and one of the points I'm making globally on this is that, uh, IP, that some of these things you need to look at are about better practices that are gonna improve outcomes, uh, not just hand hygiene and all the treatment IPC. Um, there was another point I wanted to make here. Yes, the other point is that in the post period, these babies were even higher acuity. Uh, it was, I, I don't remember the number, but many more were born um, preterm in that post period than pre period. So the, the result, these are, we didn't adjust for that. The results, these are results despite having higher acuity patients. Module four, we started on in 2016 and one of our findings, one of the huge important findings is don't start on this until you get the other things into place. I have had bad experiences when countries say we want to jump straight to that when they haven't had the others because the others really prime them to what is needed and we end up going back and starting all over again anyway. Um, but module four uh, is uh, about managing preterm and low birth weight uh, babies. And I wanna give an example in, uh, in Philippines. Uh, in 1999, and I, I'll bet that uh, uh, Ornella was there during this time in Fabella Hospital, they had a great hospital director who championed uh, KMC. He pushed his staff, his staff were neonatologists and they were resisting this. Uh, and he pushed them and pushed them and pushed them until, and he finally paid for them to go to, uh, go to Columbia to see it being done firsthand. And when they came back, they were quite excited. He, signed, he had them draft policy issuances and they converted the level two NICU into a KMC ward. And so we had an N of one there. Now they did, uh, um, they're well-meaning and they tried to do a lot, but we did not go to scale at this point. Um, in 2008 uh, was the outbreak, 2009, I was part of the drafting committee on the national policy, uh, adopting ENC and, the K and KMC uh, into, um, it, well, it, 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 when they, they issued this. And again, we had an inching up, but we only had 20 hospitals in a country that has, uh, has th more than a thousand. Uh, um, and, and I should say they have 20, but um, it, there are a lot of major ones that uh, you'll see in the next one uh, that we cover them all. What really took this to scale was that um, the group refocused uh, onto KMC. They had been focused on ENC before that, and DOH uh, led the multi-sectoral collaboration on this. That was, it. and it's a major point that Ministry of Health must be involved in these things. They must be front and center. If you have NGOs trying to do this, it's just not gonna go to scale. Uh, at least uh, if you have examples where it went to nationwide scale or even subnational, please share them. But my experience is that the ministries must be front and center in this for these things to go. And one of the most important litmus tests, and I found this across the board, is if when they do domestic funding, when they give domestic funding to it from the ministry, uh, it goes to scale far more rapidly. And you can see that it went up uh, nationwide. These are all the major hospitals that should be doing uh, KMC. We're not talking about the tiny ones. Uh, the green line is the accredited ones. Um, this is another slide just to showing the parallels that uh, uh, that the scale up, uh, the scale up followed very nicely with, uh, in Philippines, they call it EINC Philippines. Uh, it was where it started. 
uh, at, in our region, we call it ENC because the other countries did not like the acronym, and so it, it became that. Um, you can also see the Phil, Phil Health, um, which is the National Health Insurance Newborn Package Claims, which has been going up in that time. Um, in, um, I, I should also mention one other thing that's not shown here, but in the demographic and health survey, it's more than three out of four babies born in a facility are getting skin to skin contact now. As I mentioned before in the Philippines, it was a few percent when we started, when we did our study in 2008. Um, this is, um, we also had a bit of a, a revelation that not everywhere should be doing KMC uh, just because they're doing the ENC. Um, when they're getting three cases a year, just simply they should be referring uh, preferably in utero. Uh, and, and so we focus for KMC at national and provincial hospitals that, uh, um, and here there's 278 that have introduced it and excluding China, that's about 64%. As I said, in 2016, it was, it, this was very low. Uh, you would have a few isolated hospitals that were uh, doing this, but not a nationwide, not nationwide at all. And even within those few hospitals, some babies got KMC and some didn't that, that were eligible. And here, um, here you can see the proportions uh, of the facilities that are reaching it. I must mention, this is somewhat old data. So Laos and Cambodia have improved since then, and um, mainly those two. And um, so, so you have some countries that are doing much better than others. Uh, ironically, um, Vanuatu is doing better than everyone, or just about everyone, have the late start, uh, the late comer to the game. Um, uh, we have um, looking at uh, some of the things for preterm babies. Antenatal steroids is considerably better than it was at 62%, but there's a lot of room for improvement. Mag sulfate, you can pretty much guess that these are the mothers that have preeclampsia that are getting it incidentally and not the ones that are getting it because uh, it, because uh, baby it, because they're less than 32 weeks gestation. We've been working to get this into national guidelines. It's uh, it, it always takes uh, takes not months but years before you start to see these change and that's with a lot of hard work. Um, KMC, any KMC, we're about 50%, um, which uh, is not, not terrible here. Uh, um, but, uh, and this is, this is different than the other. This is looking at a, a very specific, uh, the, the group that are less than 2000 grams. And, um, but one out of five is getting continuous KMC. So we have a long way to go uh, to, to, improve that. We need to continue to work on uh, KMC, but still, this is major inroads. Um, not very many countries in the world uh, are at uh, half of babies that are eligible getting KMC. We, we work on trying to improve hospital information in, um, systems. Uh, we've done this in Mongolia, Philippines, and Vietnam. We're working on uh, not just data quality, but working on portals and other things like that with them to try to simplify the process. Uh, and we, in 2015, we established, or, or we had an informal uh, independent review group uh, and it was formalized uh, after the biennial meeting because it was found to be so useful. This group reviews and validates country progress and implementation of the regional action plan, but not just that, they validate what we're doing as well. So we get graded uh, just the same as they do. And it advises um, support to member states, mostly on the development of programmatic tools. We have six people, representation from neonatology, obstetrics, gynecology, midwifery, research and program implementation. There, if um, they're the ones in the front row uh, in this picture. Uh, this is our biennial meeting in 2015 and 2017. Uh, and um, so it was face-to-face -face then. 
Uh, unfortunately, in 2020, we got caught up by the um, uh, by COVID, and so this one was virtual. Um, but um, I, I'm, it was a very painful one, but we got through it, and countries seemed to seemed to like it. I think everyone would say that the face to face was much more fun and much more interesting, but uh, but still we we accomplished it. And uh, as an out, out offshoot of the meeting, they've asked us to extend the plan to 2030 and to issue a high level statement, which is, uh, which is circulating right now for signature. We do, um, we published uh, a number of papers on EENC. I'm just gonna show the, the ones that are relatively recent. In Philippines, we compared 2015 to uh, 11 hospitals that were in the 2015 ass 2008 assessment to the 2015 assessment and found that uh, there was massive improvement in maternal, but in, in newborn, but not maternal uh, practices. If anyone's interested, I can tell you exactly why. Um, and there was, um, it, it, so it was, um, uh, in 2015, massively improved in all of it. Uh, so, and most of this stuff started in the Philippines in 2011. So this is, uh, this represents uh, sustained practice at this point. I told you already the one in, in Vietnam about uh, improved health outcomes. In Solomon, I've told you already about the, uh, that they maintain the skills after coaching, but some skills need some refresher like uh, resuscitation because they don't see a lot of babies um, on that, so their skills get rusty on that. And I've told you about the water, um, water and sanitation uh, publication, and you've already seen the association uh, between uh, early essential newborn care and breastfeeding outcomes. Um, what we are now doing is any publication that's uh, coming out uh, as a as a result of the uh, in all papers that are country level, we make sure that Ministry of Health is, are authors on it. Uh, and in this case, uh, we've included authors from all ministries of health and country offices that participated in the annual implementation review. And that also helps us uh, helps the country officers that they can go back and talk and say, here's why we need this and this and this uh, to higher level management and the hospital senior management. We've also had some uh, campaigns uh, with, uh, and the one in the upper left uh, in, was uh, published in 2017 and it has more than a million views altogether. Uh, we've also published uh, since then the um, to the uh, to the right um, uh, the one here that's showing KMC uh, we published that uh, uh, in on World Prematurity Day uh, the we don't have very many hits on that so we need to do a little bit more advertising on it uh, but uh, please visit visit us on our website www.thefirstembrace.org and I pose the question of the group in addition to being ready to answer questions. Uh, what do we need to do to further, further catalyze change? Thank you very much. Howard, thank you so very much um, for a very rich presentation. There are so many um, comments and kudos coming through in the chat box. Bravo. Oh, gosh eye-opening for those countries that have not yet reached this um, level of care. So it's fantastic. I'm gonna pose some of the questions to you. In fact, some questions were asked and as your presentation proceeded, you, you all answered them uh, very eloquently, but a few that I think people would like more, more information on. So you said very clearly that the Ministry of Health must be front and center to make sure that this can happen and go to scale. Um, there were so many questions about you know, what is the level of investment and resourcing needed um, to initiate and to sustain? Um, what are the challenges and barriers identified for the scale up? Um, 
So, you know, there was one question that even asked, is there a context or a situation analysis undertaken before implementation? So getting into quite a lot of, of detail, but well, can we start with that question? What are the investments and resources needing to initiate and to sustain? And what are the challenges and barriers identified to the scale? Yeah, um, yes, so um, let me start with the very last uh, point. We started by, do, by working with countries to do situation analyses. And frankly, you do the situation analysis and then you hold a, a stakeholder meeting to develop, uh, you, met, you start working on the plan with a small working group, then you hold a, uh, a group. That's the traditional way. And we found that it really did not resonate with people very well. It didn't get people excited. What we found, and, and we, we, but we started that way. What we found got people excited was by, by the, the method that, I, that we now do, and that's to introduce the coaching first, because for two reasons. One is that the best advertisement for the program is a pink, happy, and healthy baby. Uh, mothers, health workers. I, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've had mothers say to me, in countries that English is not their language, but they'll speak in English to me. Uh, in, in Vietnam, one of the mothers said, uh, thank you for bringing this into my country. Uh, health workers have been, uh, have, when they get skin to skin contact, they've said, uh, that they, they relay that mothers say, oh, thank you, doctor. That feels so good, putting the baby in skin to skin contact. Um, and all these things is, um, these are your best sales points. The second part that's a best sales point is that the coaching people love. They find it fun. They're, they're playing with mannequins and they're practicing. And uh, I, when I was in Cambodia, I was told never expect uh, um, participants to stay during breaks or afterwards or any, uh, you know, they're gonna stay during the session. So don't plan on them staying during breaks. I have since heard that in every country In every country um, they've asked, can you leave the mannequins so we can practice? Uh, you see them going through the steps in the sky. Um, so, so the coaching is something that has two aspects that are very important uh, that make it so it flies. One, it's fun, but they have to, it, it's demanding because they have to pass with a 90% score to pass. And so they take it very seriously. By the way, um, some, I can't pronounce the word pedagogy, uh, some, some of the people in that profession told me that uh, what I'm doing runs completely counter to pedagogy, the, the principles. And I said, yeah, but it works perfectly for us. And it really does because it's what gets them so that they know the steps in the right order. It's, it's not just important to do the steps you need. There's some steps that you must do in the right order or you're gonna contaminate the baby or do something wrong uh, in the process. And so this helps them to know if they're in a single midwife doing it, or if it's a team doing it, this gives them that role that they need to understand the exact order that they do. So, um, so this is what we found. Now, how much did we invest? You'd be shocked at how little it is. It's not much. Um, for our entry in the countries, uh, you know, ten, twenty thousand uh, dollars We spend a week, we do the five days that I kind of described where the national facilitators first go through the coaching and then there's a, a day where, and they have to pass. And then there's a day where we train them how to ask questions and not make statements and things like that. And there's a practice uh, to do that. And, um, and then two days where they do supervised coaching and we help them improve. That also gives us the chance to see who are the strong ones so that we can work with the, with the very small core group to identify who gets paired up with who when they start to uh, to scale this up into uh, other hospitals and things like that. Um, the investment at the beginning is small, but the next year um, we, um, it, it goes up substantially and it's got, this is where we can help out some, but this is where we need Ministry of Health support. And it goes up, but it's not, it just doesn't go up that much. And if it goes up uh, it, um, okay, so um, Lao was getting, if my memory is correct, something like 300,000 a year. I may be wrong on that, but uh, that was the domestic funding. And that was, the, that was a, a break point where we started to see improvement in Lao. Before that, it wasn't much was happening, but after that, we started to see the improvement. We got some of the most committed people in Lao too, I'm very proud to say. 
um, it, we, um, it, it, I'll bet uh, Ornella may know one of them. Uh, I won't say the name, but later I'll tell you. And she became a neonatologist afterwards and just absolutely amazing. Um, the, um, so, so the investment, uh, um, it's what the countries can invest. Um, Vietnam very quickly scaled up. Uh, I never got the exact amount because it was done locally. So we could never really get the amount that was added up, but they very rapidly scaled up. Uh, within a year, they were already reaching uh, all their provinces and, and, and that's 70 some provinces, I think it's 70. And, uh, and started to reach their district hospitals, which is truly astonishing. Um, but th the amount of investment at the beginning is very little. Uh, we have always um, done, um, we've always uh, made it a point that we don't want to invest a lot of money and make them dependent on us. So it, this is one of the major principles. I, don't, I hope I answered the question. Maybe I answered too much of the question, but I hope I answered the question enough of the question. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you, Howard. Um, there's a, another kind of group of questions, and I'd like to turn to that. It's about the challenge of the high turnover of trained personnel, either in intensive newborn care units or just newborn corners in facilities. So have you been able to manage this challenge across multiple countries? Um, could you speak to that? And then another participant said that they have a problem trying to address too few health personnel. Um, so that issue of, of needing um, an adequate number of personnel to coach uh, and deliver. How have you been able to address those challenges? Okay, so um, let me start with uh, turnover. Um, I, I was told that this was a gigantic problem in the Philippines. And when we studied it, it, was, it just wasn't that, it wasn't that huge of a problem. Maybe other countries it's, it's worse. I, was told the same in Cambodia. And when we studied it, it just wasn't that big of a problem. But the bottom line is when you, one of the beauties of starting at the facility level and building, uh, in, building capacity within facilities is that they can handle it. When you have um, in, um, in uh, many places, they have basically a requirement that before uh, the new staff that come on do the um, do the um, uh, patient care. They must go through the coaching, and so when they get the batches of new groups, they often will do this. Um, some countries, uh, some places, I think is a best practice, and we really should be emphasizing this more, uh, is to include in quarterly KPIs um, uh, to that they can do um, basically demonstrate the breathing and non-breathing baby uh, scenarios. Um, and for the smaller groups to demonstrate that they can do the four checklist for KMC. Um, so for the smaller groups that are relevant. Um, so if you deal with it at the local level, it's, not, it's definitely not gonna be a problem because you, you make sure that you have enough core people that know the thing that when someone moves on that you can deal with it. The not enough people, um, you know, uh, it's, we can't change the staffing patterns. Um, we can advocate, that's the best we can do. Um, we, um, um, I'm gonna come back to the last one on uh, high staff turnover about online, um, but I'll come back to that. But uh, not enough staff, well, we work with who we have. Um, one of the things about EENC is that when you do it in the both short and long term, staff find that they have more time. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, um, we cut out a lot of unnecessary steps like bathing, uh, like um, yeah, it, it, um, a lot of the strange cord care things that were being done before. All those things get cut out so it ends up, and, and when you go through the streamlined process, uh, of just doing these are the steps, it makes them to have more time. The second thing that I wanna mention is often I find that there are people that, that are available, but they're sitting on the sidelines in the same places that I'm getting complained to that we don't have enough staff. Then, okay, and if you have a team approach, there are things that, uh, that others can be trained to do. Um, 
the um, uh, and so so I think that um, in the end we advocate on it, but we don't have much control over it. We uh, we bring up, I mean, we raise the issues, but facilities do what they can do. In the long term, it has a major reduction because the NICU gets a lot less cluttered uh, and a lot of the intensive work gets um, done. And when you start to move to KMC, um, then um, your, uh, your sick babies goes way down after that in our experience. So I think that um, it, we, we deal with both of these. Um, I don't think it's a huge, it, that either of them uh, has prevented us from moving the program ahead, even though it's, a, it's a, a somewhat of an obstacle. Um, about online training I, um, uh, um, versus online versus, okay, I misread it. On site, I'm gonna acknowledge and agree to Ibrahim uh, Karunda mm -hmm. that um, there is, the uh, coaching is uh, on site is absolutely, uh, we have never tried to do online, but the on site and getting everybody to practice and prove that they can do it is absolutely critical for this to work. Okay. Look, um, Howard, there have been so many more questions, um, but we have reached time. And so just a huge thank you. Um, we're going to continue to take these questions um, and we can share them with you afterwards. We also have a committee of practice where people continue to pose questions and we can answer. Um, yeah, so we have to say at this moment that um, this has been fantastic. Um, there has been up to 120 people present listening intently and posing great questions. So thank you so much, Howard. Um, everybody- Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So you can see the screen. Please, um, if you wish to join that community of practice, there's uh, the bit.ly join community of practice link. Um, and the final slide, um, Tala, could you share? So, you know, this was um, one, our first webinar of 2021, and we are very excited that we have a, a great program coming up for the year. The next webinar on March 17, we'll look at midwifery um, quality improvements and we will share more information as we'll share all the, the webinar series with you. Um, these are the links you can go to if you want more information. Um, this webinar was recorded and it will be shared. Um, we'll, tomorrow we'll share the link um, to the YouTube site, um, YouTube <laughs> site where it's shared. So we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you all so very much. Can I just jump one thing um, that I read, yeah. and that is, are all the modules and teaching materials available? Yes, they're on www.thefirstembrace.org. Um, it's our it's our website that we created. I'm not it, it, it's quirky, so please um, uh, please bear with us. If you have trouble finding it, contact sure. Oliver myself, and I can do it. So thank you very Brilliant. much, everyone. I'm writing it. And I guess that all of you you're going to send the questions to me to answer. Is that correct? Well, I'll share them with you and we will have an online um, community of practice so you can join and answer some of the questions there if you wish as well. It would be fantastic. Um, I've just shared, is that right? www.firstembrace.org. Um, there yes, were questions all, asking for the materials. Yes, uh, www.thefirstembrace.org. All small letters, no spaces. Uh, the First Embrace. So sorry. Okay. Um, I'll do it correctly. Okay. Um, so we will firstembrace.org. All right. So you've got all the modules there. Yeah. Um, there was a question yeah, the, if you have checklists for the coaches, etc. But what you yeah, need. They're, they're all there. And we're happy to support if people want to bring it into regions. Um, but in Ciro, in um, Afro, and in um, Emro, they, you, can, um, you can contact Oliver we can, and we can get you in contact with the regional office because it's already been done. Yeah, yeah. Introduced. Wonderful, wonderful. We needed more time. Uh, yeah, I feel like we could have another one. So thank you so much, Howard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, have a good day. Good night.